There aren't many songs that I like more than the Ode to Joy. It has such a positive message and an amazing tune. I love singing it. I love listening to the, the original version of it. One of my absolute favorite pieces of music. Makes me cry every time. But they're tears of joy. As we near the end of this year, many people think about, well, the, the resolutions that they want to make. And, and much of, of what we resolve is, is an attempt to overcome the bad habits that we have in our lives. Many, many people, they make these, these New Year's resolutions, and, and we've had some sermons about our resolve, and we've, we've had some sermons about these, but I, I specifically want to talk about this, this morning, crossing out bad habits, and the idea of overcoming these ha things that have become a part of our lives that we don't like, and we, we know that they're bad. What is a bad? bad habit. Well, a habit is something that you do so much that it becomes your normal course of action. And you can have good habits, you can have bad habits, and some of them are, I guess, neutral. They're neither good or bad, they're just what you do. Like, for example, a good habit is brushing your teeth. If you don't brush your teeth, or if you do brush your teeth, then it's going to help you uh, avoid your teeth falling out. And I've got one missing back here that's, you know, it's, a, it's annoying, it's a pain, and it was not a fun root canal. It was very painful. Had I had maybe better habits, actually the dentist said that the outside of my teeth was, the outsides of my teeth were great. So I brushed pretty well, but in between where you're supposed to floss, which I don't do very well, that's where the, the tooth decay had started, and oh man. Any of you who've had dental work, you, you guys understand this. You, you need those good habits. Uh, or how about eating breakfast? That's a good habit. Uh, or what we're doing here on Sunday morning, going to, going to worship God on Sunday morning. Do you know that is a habit that you can form? It's something that you do over and over and over until it becomes your normal course of action. And I believe the book of Hebrews uh, mentions that. It, it, we're familiar with the verse, Hebrews 10.25. Uh, and uh, it says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. But then it says, as the manner of some is. And, and that word manner there indicates that it's a habit. So you either make a habit out of worshiping God or you make a habit out of neglecting to assemble together. And we understand what the good habit is and what the bad habit is. The bad habit is something that you do normally that you shouldn't do. Using foul language, for example, or eating the wrong foods, or uh, leaving your house messy. That's, I kind of have a bad habit of, of being a little bit messy. Fortunately, I'm married to somebody who has a good habit of, of keeping me on the ball there. Uh, but... Sin can also be habitual. We can also make a habit of committing sin, of, of doing the wrong things. You know, not brushing your teeth, that's, that's just going to cause you problems in the future. But uh, when you do things that God commands or ag against which God commands, that and you make that a habit, that becomes a serious problem. That becomes a serious problem. Uh, and, and sin can be habitual. For example, if you have your Bibles, why not ca come with me to 2 Peter chapter 2? There are uh, a couple of verses in 2 Peter chapter 2 which indicate the repetitive nature of sin. First of all, it's verse 14. It says, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin. 
beguiling unstable souls, a heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. You have two phrases in that verse. It's, first of all, it says uh, that they cannot cease from sin. And this is not the idea. Uh, this is not the, somebody who follows the straight and narrow and slips because, of, uh, because they are overcome with lust or passion or desire or, or whatever. This is somebody who makes a practice of committing sin. And they, they get to the point where they, they say, well, I can't stop. Have you ever known somebody like that? Who was so, somebody who was so entrenched in their ways that they, it's not, not that they necessarily didn't want to stop, but that they felt like they couldn't. They didn't lack the, or they lacked the willpower, they lacked the control, they lacked the discipline to stop. That's what sin does. It grabs you and it doesn't let go. And the reason it does is because later on in that verse, in, in verse 14, it says a heart they have exercised with covetous practices. You see, people like this, the wicked that, that 2 Peter 2 describes, they don't just fall into it, they exercise themselves. Now, what's exercise? Well, exercise is doing physical activity repetitively to build, up your, uh, to build up your health. You build your muscles. You build your endurance. You build uh, your health. When you exercise your heart for covetous practices, what that means is you allow yourself to be covetous over and over until your heart is exercised. Your heart is very good at being covetous. Well, this is a practice of sin. This is a bad habit, then. These sins are the ones that are the tough ones to break. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, uh, puts it this way. Ephesians, of course, tells us that we were to... that we were. Uh, that we are, rather, made alive in verse 1, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So what were we like when we were dead in trespasses and sins? What is the world like? Well, it describes it in verse 2. It says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation. Conversation in the King James means lifestyle. We had our lifestyle in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Now listen to this. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Well, we have to ask, what does that word nature mean there? When it says you were in times past, here's what you did, your lifestyle. You lived by the lust of the flesh. You fulfilled the desires of the flesh. You fulfilled the desires of the mind. And because of that, you are by nature a child of wrath. We have to be careful how we look at that word nature. Some people say, well, that's innate in you. And you can't help but do wrong. But that's not what the scripture teaches. We are born pure, and we are tempted to sin. The word nature there actually means something like second nature. Something that you have practiced so much that it is part of who you are. Have you ever known anybody like that? Were you like that at one time? Hopefully you're not like that still. We don't need to be by nature children of wrath. We don't need to have practiced sin so much that we, and, and, and made sin so much of a habit that we, that we uh, well, couldn't see ourselves doing anything else. So nature there is long-standing practice. There's a difference uh, mentioned in 1 John chapter 1. A difference between somebody who is walking in darkness and somebody who is walking in light. Jo 1 John, rather. I'm sorry, I said John. 1 John chapter 1 verse 6 says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. 
But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice the two opposites there. The one who walks in darkness and the one who walks in the light. This is not somebody who, for lack of a better term, dabbles in darkness. Now that's still wrong. It's still wrong, but what's he talking about here? He's talking about people who make a habit, a practice of doing unrighteousness. That's what it means to walk in darkness. And there are many reasons why people do this. Maybe at the beginning, they don't treat the sin as something that is terrible. Maybe they don't see it for something that is that bad. Have you ever found yourself justifying something? Saying, well, it's not that bad. One thing that we humans like to do is compare our wrongdoing and our actions with the actions of others. Do you know why that's a bad idea? You know why it's a bad idea? Because every single person on this planet, save one, is going to find somebody who's worse than them, right? I mean, you get down to the bottom of the the group, you're going to have to look really hard. If If you're that bad, but if you're trying to do well in the middle of the pack, you're going to find millions of people who are worse than you. But just because somebody is living their life worse than me doesn't mean that I'm okay. It's like if somebody's walking down the middle of a railroad track and I'm walking down that same track off to the side a little bit. You know, I'm just walking on one of the rails and... and guy next to me is walking down the middle. Well, he's more on the railroad tracks, but is he more in danger? No, when the train comes, we're both going to get hit. So it's not good to compare ourselves with other people. But oftentimes we do, and that helps us to justify our repetitive actions, walking in darkness and walking in the light. Now, we love verse 7. We love verse 7 because it says if we we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. That's fellowship that we have between God and us. And that happens, look at this, because it says if we walk in the light, that happens for as long as we're walking in the light. Because of that conditional phrase there, if we walk in the light, we have fellowship. That means as long as we walk in the light. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleans. Now look at this. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. God understands that even Christians are going to sin occasionally. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, I know you've heard it before because I've taught it before. Christians will commit sin. If we walk in the light, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. It doesn't say that it has cleansed us from our past sins. No, it says it cleanses us from our present sins. Those that we might commit as we walk in the light. And you may wonder, how can you walk in the light and commit a sin? Well, if I walk in the light and I commit a sin, what do I do? There is a plan that God has set in place for people who want to walk in the light who mess up. And what is that plan? It's the second law of pardon, isn't it? You find that in Acts chapter 8, where, the, uh, where Simon the sorcerer, uh, he gets greedy, doesn't he? He wants to buy the apostles' power. And Peter tells him to repent and to pray. That perhaps the thought of his heart might be forgiven him. So repentance and prayer is what is required. If I do that, then guess what? I still walk in the light. It's an amazing thing. There's a difference, though, between 
committing a sin and being cleansed of my sin as I walk in the light. There's a difference there between that and walking in darkness. If we, walk, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. That person's not getting cleansed from all unrighteousness. So they're two different people. Making, there's the one making a practice of sin, and then there's the one who does not make a practice of sin, but who sins occasionally. That's why I'm very careful to say, yeah, we sin every day. I don't want to be the one who makes a practice of sin and then justifies it by saying, well, I can't help myself. I sin all the time. There's a difference. And there's a biblical difference between that. There's no excuse for making a practice of sin. If you're making a practice of sin and you say that you're a righteous person, guess what? You're a liar. It's a dangerous thing, a dangerous road to tread. We don't need to practice wickedness. We don't need to make a habit out of wickedness. But in fact, we must rule our own spirits. Proverbs 25, 28 says, He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that's broken down and without walls, waiting to be destroyed, waiting for destruction. Proverbs says a lot of things. I like pride goes before destruction. Or pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. So Proverbs tells us a lot of things that we can do to get ourselves destroyed. Here it says, if you don't have rule over your own spirit, then you're waiting for destruction, aren't you? Because that's what a city without walls is. It's just waiting for the forces of evil to sweep through the, and there's no defense Ruling your own spirit, a short word for that, or a word for that is discipline, isn't it? Now, in the second place, first, that was what is a bad habit. That was point number one. The sec in the second place, two out of two. How do we overcome bad habits? How do we overcome them? Well, well how do we cross out bad habits? Jesus certainly wants us to. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 10, it says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why, eat, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus came to this earth so that he could help us cross out those bad habits. He wants us to make those resolutions, not just at New Year, but he wants us to continue through with those and make a habit of, of following righteousness. How do we do that? Well, there are several things in Scripture, several things that, that we can do. First of all, I believe that if you're ever going to overcome a bad habit, if we're ever going to overcome bad habits, what we need to do is we need to own our actions. We need to own our actions. I'm always saying this, and Rebecca kind of teases me about it sometimes. But I believe it's very important to own your actions. What's that mean? You do something good, own your action. You do something bad, own it. If you look at Genesis chapter 3... The very first sin is committed, and what happens? Well, they're not owning what they have done. They eat of the fruit. They eat of the fruit of the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And their eyes are open. By the way, what kind of fruit was it? Well, obviously it's fig leaves because God made them clothes out of fig, fig leaves. So obviously they ate fig leaves, right? No, I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> it's fruit. Who cares? But after they had committed this sin, it says they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they didn't want to own their actions. They didn't want to admit to what they did. Why? Because they knew it was wrong. You see, in John chapter, uh, John chapter 3, Jesus talks about light and darkness, and he explains why darkness hates the light so much. Light makes manifest all of their wicked deeds and reproves them. Well, darkness doesn't want to own up to what it does. And people walking in darkness do not want to own up to what, to, what they have done. Adam and Eve were new to this, weren't they? They had no prior experience. They had nobody to, to give them you know, the things of the past. You know, parents sometimes tell their children, don't do what I did. Here's the mistake that I made. You should try to avoid it. And then the child says, you don't know anything. Then they grow up and later they say, I'm sorry I said that. You do know a lot of things. Well, yeah, I'm still suffering because of it. That's what we try to do. And kids so often don't listen. Some of them listen to their parents and they avoid pain and hardship and struggle. But Adam and Eve, what did they? They were new to this whole sinning business. So they commit sin and God's walking through the garden in the cool of the day. That's anthropomorphism, I believe, where God takes on the characteristics of a human being. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hadst thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? <laughs> Sounds like me talking to my three-year-old. Once again, Adam and Eve are new to this. And for all intents and purposes, remember, their age is very young. They were just created. Have you eaten of the tree that I told you not to eat? And how did Adam respond? The man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Adam, just own your actions. Say, yes, I did. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Well, own it. Don't pass it off to the serpent. Well, the serpent doesn't have anybody to pass it off to, and he knows better. He wasn't new to the sin game, after all. And God just curses the serpent. Psalm 51 was written right after David suffered the loss of a child because of, or right after um, Nathan the prophet came to him after he had committed sin with Bathsheba. And notice how he handles this. Nathan convinces him. He tells him this uh, parable of a rich man and a poor man one has many flocks and herds, and another one has just one small little ewe lamb. And when he says that the rich man took the poor man's lamb for a visitor, David said, that, how dare that man do that? And Nathan said, thou art the man. And this, this is the response that David gave. In verse 1 he says, have mercy upon me, O God according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. Sometimes it takes a painful lesson to cause us to own what we have done. But how are we going to change? How are we going to show true repentance if we deny that we've done something wrong? It doesn't work. 
Psalm 34, 15 through 18. It says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of, their tr- out of all their troubles. Now look at this. The Lord is near unto them that are of a broken heart, and he saves such as be of a contrite spirit. Those who acknowledge their sins find themselves close to God. Well, what else do we need? How do we overcome bad habits? We need to, first, we need to acknowledge our actions, but secondly, I suggest, well, I don't suggest, the Bible teaches that we make ourselves accountable to someone else. This is difficult. It's difficult to do because what do we have to do? Well, we have to own our actions to another person. Look at the bad that I am doing. Look at the bad that I and and if I if I'm still correct if I'm correct in saying that that fear of rejection is still the number one fear that human beings have, it makes sense that telling somebody what I have done, which is going to give them the opportunity to reject me, that's a difficult thing, isn't it? But friends strengthen one another. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 and 10, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Look at this. For if they fall... The one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he has not another to help him up. Why do people continue down that, down, down that spiral into habitual wickedness? Why? Because they don't have anyone to stop their descent. They don't have anyone to catch them as they fall and lift them up. So we need people around us. Do you know what coming together to worship with the saints is for? There's a word in the New Testament that's used. It's called it's edification. What's that mean? It means to build one another up. And that's directly the opposite of letting them fall down. You're building them up and helping them as they fall. James chapter 5 illustrates or or uses this principle. James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now you may interpret this to mean, well, confess that you have faults, but everybody has faults, don't they? It is not a confession to say, I have sinned in my life. Hey, guess what, congregation? I have sinned in my life. Are you surprised? Are you? You're flabbergasted, taken aback, right? Because I struggle with sin, right? Oh, wait. If I said the opposite of that, I'm the preacher and therefore I have no sin, what would you say? Liar! And that's what God says. So me just getting up and saying, yeah, I got sin in my life, that's not a confession. What's James talking about? He's talking about those who are in habitual, who are struggling with the habit of sin. When you confess your faults to another person, what are you doing? You're making yourself accountable. That's what this verse is about. It's not just, oh yeah, I've done wrong things. That doesn't help anything. It's a cop-out. No, what are you struggling with? What is threatening to become your habit? Maybe somebody else can help. That's what we're here for. And, And just sort of tangentially here, this is one of the reasons that gossip is so harmful. 
Because when you speak about somebody behind their back for the wrong things that they do, they're not going to want to confess their faults to anybody. That's why it's so harmful. That's why it's so hurtful. Because we are here to help one another overcome those sins. Oh, did you know that so-and-so did, did this bad? Well, you're doing it too. Finally, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, talks about the love that we are to have for God. If we are to overcome bad habits, we should substitute good habits for them. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy, thy hand and they shall be as frontlets between thy eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. What happens when your life is filled with the word of God? When you talk about God every chance that you get, what happens? Well, you're substituting good habits for bad. You are walking in the light and not in darkness. This season tends to be a time when folks think about these things, these bad habits that they have. And they try. They say the, the, year is, is, the new year is coming. I'm going to overcome them. And that's great. What bad habit do you have? And how are you planning on overcoming those bad habits. If you try to do it alone, without God, it's not going to work. But with God, all things are possible. We're going to sing an invitation song, and if you have a need, you can make that known. Do you need to be baptized to have your sins washed away, or are you a Christian who's struggling with something and you need to return to following the right way. Whatever it is, we as a congregation are here for you. Just make your need known. Let's stand and sing.